In this week's video I will talk about ankle impingement syndromes on MRI, what to look for and what not to look for. Now make sure you stick till the end because I've got a very special tip for you. The topic of this video was suggested by one of my newest patrons, Brian. Hi Brian, thanks for your support, it's really great. And if you want to become part of the patron community that is supporting my channel, go check the link down here below and you can make maybe a suggestion for a future video as well. Make sure you hit the like button and also subscribe now if you haven't already. Now ankle impingement syndromes, there are more than like just one uh, entity. If you go into the literature, you typically find five or four different types of ankle impingements depending on the location, as you can see here. I will certainly do um, videos about the anterior one, which is the current video. I might do one about anterior lateral impingement and posterior impingement. Now, focusing on the anterior ankle impingement, um, normally you have bony spurs or osteophytes at the anterior side of the ankle joint. And one important finding here is that they lie intraarticularly rather than where the joint capsule inserts. But this is also a little bit depending on um, the location and we will cover that later on. Now, but for now, realize that you have some bony overgrowth or spurs here that actually limit your dorsal extension of the foot. So your range of motion is limited because you have bony structures that are impinging each other and the soft tissue in between. So what you get is an irritation, bone marrow edema, soft tissue edema at this location in patients with anterior ankle impingement syndrome. Now it is important to realize that it's actually a clinical diagnosis and not a diagnosis that we can make on MRI alone. So why do these spurs occur? Now in soccer players for example it is believed that the repetitive hitting of the ball can actually lead to some kind of bony overgrowth or spurs at this location. But that's just one theory. Now here in the diagram you can see where these spurs or osteophytes can actually occur. The typical ones are in the region here, anterior tibia, just next to the cartilage, just like a typical osteophyte as you know it. Then you can have them also at this location, at the end of the cartilage of the Taylor dome, and sometimes they are located a little bit further distally, just next where the joint capsule inserts. And anatomic studies, as I mentioned, have shown that these are more frequently intraarticularly than rather uh, traction and tissophytes from the joint capsule. Now, I mentioned already it's common in soccer players, ballet dancers, but also other athletes, and most often it's just bony spurs and less so uh, some kind of soft tissue problematic that's actually limiting the range of motion. There was an interesting study by Hyrie et al. in HR 2009 that showed that if the spurs are medially on the talus, they are intraarticular and therefore considered osteophytes, whereas on the lateral side of the talus they seem to be extraarticularly and therefore more likely to be traction and tissophytes. But I think this is just a theoretical concept. If you just call them bony spurs, you're on the safe side, and I think that should be enough. Some studies try to really go into a lot of detail um, with hypointense fibrous bands and very subtle findings for this kind of entity, but I would suggest, just forget about it, just describe the bony spurs. So here we have a 30-year-old recreational soccer player with anterior ankle pain one year after a hyperextension trauma, and what we can see here immediately, so we have a T1, a stir, and this one here is a proton density fat saturated sequence. We have these spurs here in the anterior portion of the ankle joint, and this is the stir and it's sometimes not so easy to see on a stir image, especially at regions like this here. And it's much easier to see on a T1 sagittal here, as you can see. Now let's make this one big and let's try to see where we have osteophytes. If you remember the diagram, then you will remember, so you have these osteophytes here at this most anterior portion here. The second side where you can have osteophytes is just where the cartilage ends, so at this level here. I think you can nicely see this type of osteophytes here. And then sometimes you have irregularities or spurs a little bit farther here or further here, which then are not really inside the joint anymore. So at this side here, this one is probably from a some kind of insertion here. You can see the joint capsule is inserting here. So this is what sometimes we call the Taylor nose. And some of them are a little bit more here in this 
tiny fossa here and can be intraarticularly as I have shown you in this first diagram. Now we can nicely see here on this T1 of the gadolinium that this osteophytes here, this one is clearly intraarticularly, so the joint capsule is not inserting here. Let I me mean, maybe even go bigger. So the joint capsule is not, that's too big, joint capsule is not inserting here, but it's inserting down here. So even this irregularity here is most likely an interarticular spur. This one here is this osteophyte at this very specific location. And of course, all these spurs or osteophyte formation at the anterior border of the tibia is a very obvious finding. And the joint capsule inserting somewhere up here and you can see here some indirect arthrography effect where this is uh, the fluid going up until here. Now this patient then underwent um, surgery because he had obviously clinical um, symptoms of anterior ankle impingement which is not really hard to understand so if you think about this morphology there is not a lot of dorsal extension that this patient can do so this Spurs here will immediately have contact with this kind of changes there and therefore limiting this range of motion and being painful for the patient. So here is the preoperative radiograph of this patient and you can see the same osteophytes here at this anterior location, tiny one down here. This one is not really a osteophyte and I wouldn't call this a spur, so this is more like a traction and thesiophyte here from the joint capsule as I have shown you previously. So um, maybe my diagram was not 100% accurate with the reality. But anyways, so we can see this very large osteophytes here at this very specific location with uh, potentially a loose ossicle there or maybe after recurrent trauma and fracture of an osteophyte. So you can also easily understand why this patient has difficulties dorsally extending his foot because these bony structures, these spurs here will immediately have contact with this ossifications there and therefore limiting his range of motion and impinging maybe even folds of the joint capsule or of just bony contact which is painful then. Now he underwent surgery and this was the post-surgical uh, or radiograph some time after surgery and although it was slightly better he still had persisting pain uh, in the anterior ankle joint some some residual anterior ankle impingement and what we can see is we still have this spur up here they resected the portions down here and this uh, border here so this spur here is still the same they this one they that was not touched so here we have another patient with anterior ankle impingement and in addition to anterior ankle impingement a little bit anteromedial impingement which is also one of the five types that i mentioned at the beginning of the video so he has now anterior ankle impingement clinically and we can see basically two different things let me just pull in the T1 here quickly too. First of all, there is a lot of edema in the anterior portion of the ankle joint. The joint capsule is this structure here. So it's not as wide as we have it in my diagram. It's very narrow, it's small, it's scarred, it's thickened, and we have all this imbibation or scarring all around the joint capsule here. And whether this is from the initial surgery, potentially, or from just from the trauma, um, it's, it's hard to say because I don't have any prior exams, but all this edema, etc., is an indication that there is something going on. And you can now also see here some bone marrow edema at the level of this anterior spur, which is much smaller than in the previous patient, but we have some correspond uh, corresponding bone marrow edema also here at this anterior edge of the tailored dome, and this is a little bit, this is pretty much centrally in the joint. On the lateral side here, this is the fibula, on the lateral side there is uh, less going on and on the medial side we have again a lot of edema and then here's something that looks like a ganglion cyst in the course of the uh, anterior tibiotalar ligament. Which is probably also not helping with his movement. There are basically two things here. The osteophytes are there, but they are less extensive, less extensive than in the previous case. And in addition to that, we have this very scarred and shrinked joint capsule, which is thickened, and we have some synovitis or synovial proliferations, or just any kind of stuff inside the joint capsule, which will further um, impede with the dorsal extension of this foot. And the edema all around it is just like the result of this chronic impinging um, between these bones and the joint capsule 
which is quite understandable. So this is a very obvious case. Now, my personal strategy is more to focus on the bony changes and the spurs and osteophytes rather than the actual soft tissue component, which might be a result of even an acute trauma, um, but it can also be obviously from impingement, but then I would really suspect to have a thickened joint capsule with synovitis, etc. in this portion. So just don't call any edema in this anterior region of the ankle joint suggestive of a anterior ankle impingement. And that's basically what happened in this case. You can see here it's a, it's a young child, I think 10 years old, with pain in the ankle joint. And I think there was probably some trauma in the history as with everybody. And you can see this pretty extensive edema here anteriorly of the ankle joint. There is even some effusion going on here. And if you look the bony structures, we can't see on this term sequence any spurs of the tibia, which he would be pretty young anyways. And also this edge here is rather smooth. There's a tiny uh, portion here, but that's I think still normal. Then there are no spurs in this groove here. And this one here is just a capsular insertion with some overgrowth here, some antesophyte or traction change there, which is completely normal. We can also try to have a look at other sequences here quickly. So here is a PD space sequence, very thin sections, and you can see a nice little joint capsule where it, there is a little knob is. Rather than that, no spurs. There is a little irregularity down here, and this is where we have most of the bone marrow edema anyways. So this area here, which was then believed to be a result from the anterior impingement with some bone bruising, etc, etc. Because the symptoms persisted, the patient came back three months later to that institution. Uh, it's an external institution, obviously. <laughs> and he had basically the same presentation. So extensive bone marrow edema, a lot of joint diffusion, maybe even a little bit more also on the tail on the navicular joint, still this very prominent edema in the anterior soft tissues of the ankle joint. And now the radiologist had the good idea that this might actually be something else. Um, stress fracture unlikely due to the cores. Let me just show them next to each other. So here we have the new image. This is the old one three months prior. And you can see it's pretty much the same image. And this makes a lot of differential diagnosis unlikely. So it's not a bone bruise, it's not a uh, some kind of insufficiency or stress fracture of the talus, um, it's not infection, anything like that. Anterior ankle impingement is unlikely because we don't have any bony changes that are supporting this diagnosis. Um, the amount of effusion is also uh, strange now a little bit more at this side and because if it would be impingement patient probably did some I don't know maybe some kind of conservative treatment which should result in relief of symptoms at least potentially with rest etc so we would expect bone marrow edema to go uh, back or get smaller at least but it's pretty much the same so the radiologist actually had a very good idea that this might be a osteoid osteoma of the talus and what do you do then? You do a CT scan and you can see it nicely here. You can nicely see here this needles here. And we don't see sclerosis all around it, but this is a very typical finding with this kind of intraarticular osteoid osteomas that they don't form a lot of osteoid or uh, sclerosis or sclerotic bone around it, as opposed, for example, to a cortical osteoid osteoma of the femoral shaft or something like that. So these intraarticular osteosteomas can present with extensive bone marrow edema, effusion and just an irritation of the whole joint. And now it makes kind of sense that this bone marrow edema, effusion, etc. This is all related to this osteosteoma here where it's breaching or um, it's opening into the joint and therefore making this kind of inflammatory process here of the joint. So, but this is pretty much a very rare example, but I just wanted to show you that not all edemas in the anterior ankle joint are ankle impingement, and I would really more focus on the bony changes. Yeah, I think that's it. So I probably mentioned this already a few times during the video, 
but ankle impingement basically is a clinical diagnosis and we can see patients with ankle impingement syndrome actually without having a lot of morphological changes or even the other way around where patients have very prominent spurs or osteophytes at the anterior portion of the ankle joint but actually do not have anterior ankle impingement syndrome. So the same will be true in the other uh, different kind of impingement syndromes as we will cover in the next few weeks but just keep in mind that it's really a clinical diagnosis. Impingement by itself is a dynamic process and we just are looking at static images and therefore we should not go overboard and really just uh, right in our conclusion that this is ankle impingement because we simply cannot know. Now you can say if the clinical um, information is very suggestive or suggesting a ankle impingement syndrome that these anterior spurs are most likely contributing or uh, are consistent with anterior ankle impingement syndrome. You can say that but you should not say this is ankle impingement. The same is true for hip impingement. So hip impingement is also not like an MR diagnosis by the way. Yeah, I think that's it for this week. Thanks for watching and make sure you check back next week when I cover the other different types of ankle impingement syndrome. I'm not sure yet whether I do like separate videos for anterolateral and posterior or whether I do a combined video. We'll see about that. And with that, that's it and see you next time.